morning, Inniswood. As you can see, we've gone back to online services. We will be scheduling the service to go live on Facebook at 1030 each Sunday until the province opens up again. You can also watch the service on YouTube, on our website, and in the weekly bulletin. Also, members, please check today's bulletin for an important video message from the Leadership Board. Today is Communion Sunday, so please have a bit of juice and a cracker or whatever you use at home for your at-home communion and have that ready for that portion of today's service. Our sermon for the next two weeks will feature a guest speaker. Reverend Tom Cullen joins us from Forest, Ontario, where he recently moved. Pastor Cullen has been a pastor within CBOQ for his whole pastoral career, pastoring in Ancaster, Markham, Scarborough, and more. And as you may remember, Pastor Cullen joined our church in December of 2019 as a guest preacher for one Advent Sunday, and we welcome him back today to hear part one of a two-part message that God has put on his heart to share with our congregation. Let us quiet our hearts now and prepare for our service and worship time.
Dear precious God and Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, dear Lord, that we just praise you and worship you and adore you, Father. Father, I wish we could find words to adequately describe who you are, but Father, the best we can do is just what's, what's given to us, Father. We need your Holy Spirit to help us yes, to really uh, express, Father, our gratitude towards you, Lord. As our words go up before you this morning, Father, will you receive uh, these words of, of worship and, and adoration and praise, Father? But Father, you certainly are worthy of all honor and all glory and all praise, Father. Father, if there be any idols in our lives, dear God, would you remove them, Lord, that Christ alone may rule and reign supreme in the cradle of our hearts, Father, that nothing else would take his place, Father. I thank you so much for your love and your mercy and compassion, which are new each and every day, Heavenly Father. And Lord, where would we be without you? Lord, many years ago, I remember talking to somebody, and I said, how does any, and she said, who does, how does anybody live without Christ? And Father, I, re, I replied, I know I can't, and I don't know how anybody can. And yet, Father, we, we so desperately need you in our world today, Father. Father, I pray for revival and renewal and restora restoration of your people, Heavenly Father. That we are people who are called by your name, will humble ourselves before you, before one another, and go to our knees, Father, and confess our sins and repent of them, O Lord God, that you may come, Father, that you would hear our prayers and that you would heal us, Father. Heal we, your people. Heal your church, Father. Quicken us, awaken us, Heavenly Father. And we would go forth, Father, with a holy boldness and our hearts bursting with love and gratitude toward you, Father, for what you have done for us. And also, Father, a, a, a fear of you, Lord, not a fear that causes us to run away, but causes us to run toward you, Father, and give you the honor, the glory, and the respect, Father, that you deserve. And Father, some, we, we often, Father, take you for granted, Lord. Forgive us, Father. Forgive us, Lord, for we are, we are a sinful people, Father. But we are a pe simple people saved by the grace and mercy of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, Heavenly Father. And Father, God, what else can I say, Lord? I just pray to God for those in our church, Lord, who do not know you, Father, that you would draw them with irresistible grace, Father. Save them to the uttermost, Lord, and be to them according to your will and purpose for their lives, Heavenly Father. I pray for our young people, Lord, dear God. Watch over them, Father. There's so much pressure and peer pressure that they're under today, Father, when they're at school or out in their community, Lord, that they would be the generation that would take a stand, Father, and influence their generation for Christ, Lord. Uh, Father, I pray for our seniors again, Lord, to God, uh, that these are dear people, Father, who have a history and a story to tell us, Lord, a story that we need to hear, Father. And I just pray to God that you would help them to know and understand, Lord, that you still have a ministry for them, a mission for them, Father, wherever they are, that you have not put them upon the shelf that you have not set them aside, that you still have a plan for their lives, Father, and that the greatest chapter in their life would yet, could yet be written, Father, full of uh, wonderful, beautiful, awesome things, Father, that would, that would be written, dear, dear Lord God, that they would uh, yet be the most exciting time of their, and the challenging time of their lives, Father. I think of Moses at the age of 80, Father, you started with him at, at that late stage of life. Abraham at the end, age of 75, Lord, as you sent him out, Father, where he did not where he was going, but Lord, you let him and guide him. And along the way, Father, these two great men of God, Father, became great men of God because you are a great and awesome God whom they, whom they followed and served, Father. And as they traveled this road, Lord, they, uh, they learned uh, about your heavenly Father, who this God is, and, they, and they, uh, they walked in obedience, Father. Although they themselves were not perfect, Father, they did walk in obedience, Lord. I thank you so much, Father. I thank you, Father, for each and every one of our leadership uh, uh, team, Father. I pray that you'd be with each and every one of us, uh, one of us Father, that you grant, grant us wisdom and discernment, Heavenly Father, as we, as we uh, lead and, and, and guide the people in this church, Lord. And I pray to God that we as leaders, Father, would become a role model for each and every one in this church, Father, with uh, uh, leaders who are filled with the Spirit of Christ, Father, would go forth, Father, leading and guiding with skillful, with, with the honesty, with integrity, and with skillful hands, Heavenly Father. So lead us and guide us, oh Lord God. And Father, it is an awesome responsibility that you've given us, Father. Help us, Lord God, not to, not to fail you, Father, but to, to move forward, Father. To rise up out of the ashes of defeat, Father. Move forward in victory, Father, that is yet to come, that is yet to be ours, Lord. Father, I think of Isaiah, where he said, you know, uh, forget the former things, forget the past. I am doing new things. Do you not perceive it, Father? Mm -hmm. And Lord, I believe you're preparing, you are preparing for us for something wonderful, something great, something awesome, Heavenly Father. Something new would happen in this church, Lord. A revival, a new order, a, a, and a restoration, Heavenly Father. That we would humble ourselves before you, O Lord God, and, and before one another, confessing our sins, repenting of our wicked ways, Father, and moving forward, Father, rising up, Father, and moving forward, renewed, refreshed, restored, Heavenly Father, 
go forth with a holy boldness, Father, upon our hearts, Lord, to, to reach the lost of this generation, Father, their God, that, that, that we would go forth, Father, and, and, and Father, proclaim the name of Jesus, not only in word, Father, mm -hmm. but in deed, because for some of us, for a lot of people, Father, we may be the only Bible that they read, Father, and that we would walk, Father, forth with the beauty, the fragrance, the flavor of Christ wherever we go, Father, that people would see Christ in us, Lord, and create within them a hunger and a thirst and a desire to know you. And that we go forth, Father, looking at those who aren't saved, not as our enemies, Father, but as potential brothers and sisters in Christ, yet to be brought into your kingdom, Lord, that these people would come in and join us, Father. And I just thank you and praise you so much, Father, for the awesome privilege of prayer. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for the privilege of being with you today at Inneswood. Janet and I have fond memories of our time with you in 2019, and I trust that as uh, we minister together uh, during these next two weeks, we will know God working in our midst. Uh, as we listen to God's word this morning, uh, could you do me a favor and have a blank piece of paper ready? Uh, I want to do a, a little exercise with you at the end, a blank piece of paper and a pen, okay? Uh, it will be an exercise between you and God. You don't have to share it with anyone, just a blank piece of paper and a pen. And if you had that ready now, you'll be ready to participate fully at the end of the sermon. Just pause the video if you need to. Uh, we'll be here when you get back and uh, just get that ready. And I hope that you have your Bible with you. We'll be um, studying Psalm 55 this morning, and we'll look at the whole psalm, but particularly we'll be examining verse 22. Psalm 55, let us hear God's word to us. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught because of what my enemy is saying, because of the threats of the wicked, for they bring down suffering on me and assail me in their anger. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen on me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter far from the tempest and storm. Lord, confuse the wicked, confound their words, for I see violence and strife in the city. Day and night they prowl about on its walls. Malice and abuse are within it. Destructive forces are at work in the city. Threats and lies never leave its streets. If an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked about among the worshippers. Let death take my enemies by surprise. Let them go down alive to the realm of the dead, for evil finds lodging among them. As for me, I call to God, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. He rescues me unharmed from the battle waged against me, even though many oppose me. God, who is enthroned from of old, who does not change, he will hear them and humble them, because they have no fear of God. My companion attacks his friends. He violates his covenant. His talk is smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. His words are more soothing than oil, yet they are drawn swords. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. But you, God, will bring down the wicked into the pit of decay. The bloodthirsty and deceitful will not live out half their days. But as for me, I trust in you. This is the word of the living God, and we give thanks to him for it. Let us pray. O oh God, may we hear your voice today. For we are a people who are hungry and thirsty for you. In your grace, come and minister to each one of us. 
correct us, affirm us, and let us live for you and you alone. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I spoke with the leaders of your church and I prayed over what I should say today, I'd like to bring to you a word to sustain you and support you during these difficult times. We are facing difficult times in our world. And I can't lay any claim to the words that I'm going to share with you. I'm merely pointing out what God has already given to you as a gift in Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. It's a promise that Peter will rephrase in his first letter in the New Testament. Cast all your anxiety upon him, for he cares for you. But we read this wonderful promise first. In Psalm 55, cast all your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. And I realize that this text can be used as a kind of trivial piece of advice that we give to people who are going through a tough time. You know, oh, simply cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. And we must beware of using scripture flippantly and without thought as a kind of spiritual band-aid to the problems that we're facing. I'm not negating the power of God's word or the ability of the, of the Spirit to bring change and healing in our life through his word. But when we unthinkingly quote scripture to people who are going through difficult times, we can do more harm than good. So, let's think deeply about the promise that God gives to us in Psalm 55, and let's think about what it says to us. I want us to think in three ways. I want us to see here a word of challenge, a word of care, and a word of surrender. First, a word of challenge. Cast all your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. That word cast means to give over or lay upon. The picture is of a person who's carrying a heavy load and they stop and they lift their heavy burden and they put it on the back of another. And in this case, it's God himself. And that seems to be straightforward enough, doesn't it? You know, we, we carry this burden and we, oh, it's, it's worrying us, it's causing us uh, distress and we cast it on to God. That seems straightforward enough. But hear the word of challenge here. The word of challenge is that we must address our burdens and name our anxieties and give them over to God. And the naming of our burdens can be challenging. Why? To name our burdens, that can be challenging because the pull of the escapist impulse is very strong. So many people say that the Christian faith is escapism. You Christians, they say, you're always trying to run away from your problems. It's all pie in the sky. Why aren't you Christians more realistic? And I would say <laughs> to them, mm, I think the Christian faith is the most realistic faith and the most realistic answer to life's wor worries that, that, that is ever offered in this world. The Christian faith says that you and I have a heavenly father whose love has been revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ and who walks with us and talks with us and encourages us to cast our burdens upon him. But before we do that, we have to acknowledge our burden. We have to recognize the heart of our worries. We have to be able to say, this is what is weighing us down. This is what is stressing me. This is what is causing me sleepless nights. There's no running away from problems in the Christian faith. Before you cast your cares on the Lord, you have to face the challenge of naming them and giving them to God. And this is the experience of the psalmist. Look at the text. Verses 1 through 3, the psalmist calls out to God in prayer. He says, do not ignore my plea, O God. Hear me and answer me, he says in verse 1. And he names the source of his distress in verses 2 and 3. The voice of the enemy, the threats of the wicked, for they bring down suffering on me and assail me in their anger. And the depth of his distress is such that he says in verse 4 and 5, my heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen on me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. And this is a terrible situation that he finds himself in. He's not just being poetic here. 
He is deeply disturbed by what is happening to him. He's in deep distress. And then look what he says at verse 6. Oh, that I had the wings of a dove. He's in deep distress. And, and he says, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and I would be at rest. There's the pull of the escapist impulse. It's the exact opposite of casting your burden on the Lord because it is the solution that does not make you face your pain. It does not make you address your situation. It does not make you name your trouble. It is fleeing away far from the tempest and storm, as the psalmist says in verse 8. And in answer to the world that says that Christianity is an escapist faith, we'd say, no, 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 it's not. It is the world that is always encouraging us to, to, to buy a lottery ticket so that we might win and get away from it all. And every day would be a dream come true. It is the world that tells us that we must escape to this blockbuster movie or that winter getaway. Come away and get away from it all. It is the world that is that always tells us somewhere over the rainbow, our dreams come true. But the Christian faith says no such thing. The psalmist rejects this, the escapist impulse. It's strong to be sure. It is present there, but he rejects it. And he says, cast your cares on the Lord. And so you also. You are encouraged to cast your cares on the Lord. That means you have to name those cares and acknowledge them, and you have to say that they're real, and that can be a challenge in the escapist world in which we live. But there's also this. To name our burdens can be challenging because of the pain associated with it. Let me explain. When we name our burdens, when we address our cares, we discover that those things that cause us to worry, we discover that those things that cause us anxiety in our lives are the very things that we worship. The things that cause us anxiety are the things that we have allowed to replace God in our lives. For instance, are you worried about your career? You have to ask yourself, why? Has your career become a God in your life? Are you anxious about your status in life? Why? Have you allowed your status to become a God in your life? Are you concerned about your health? Why? Have you allowed your health to be of utmost importance? Do you worship your physical health? It can be even a good thing that you worry about. It can be something like the church that, that, that is causing you worry and stress. And, and you have to ask yourself, why? Now, we have to be careful here, don't we? Of course, we need to take care of ourselves. It's not godly to be a slob. Of course, we should be wise in our career choices. Of course, we should care for the church. It is the body of Christ. Of course, we should care for the church. But listen, listen. We have to do the hard work of asking ourselves, do the things I worry about, do the things that you worry about, take the place of God in your life. Do you worship them to such a degree that if they were taken away from you, then your world would fall apart and your faith in God would waver? Psychologist Alfred Adler once wrote that it was very difficult, that it is very difficult, to pinpoint what we are living for. You can't find out what you're living for by simply sitting down with a pen and paper and making a list. He says, we're not that self-aware. You may say that you're living for God, for instance, but you can't figure that out simply by sitting down and asking yourself the question. No, no, no. He says, the only way to figure out what you're really living for is to look at what disturbs you, what causes you to be anxious, what causes you to be stressed if you were to lose it. He says, our deepest emotions, anxiety, fear, despair, will point you to your God. And this is the challenge, isn't it? We don't like exposing the truth about ourselves. We don't like admitting that God isn't the center of our lives. You know, we're thinking, yeah, oh, sure, God's the center of my life. And we don't like admitting that he isn't. But this is what the text is calling us to. Cast all your cares on the Lord. And do you understand what happens when we do that, right? 
You're made to say, oh, that's what I've been living for. That's what I value. That's what has taken the place of God in my life. And that, be, that can be very difficult as you realize that you aren't as God-centered as you thought you were. But it can also be very freeing. All of a sudden, you realize that your life is full of idols that have taken the place of God in your life, and you can identify them, and you can get rid of them. But more, when you cast your care upon the Lord, he then takes his proper place as God in your life. When we try to run away, run away from our troubles, when we try to hang on to our troubles, we're shutting God out and we're continuing in our worship of the things of this world. But when we cast our cares upon the Lord, we're addressing our cares and we're saying to the Lord, you are my God and I will bow my heart and my head toward you. I trust you in this situation. I trust you with my career. I trust you with this relationship. I trust you with my health or this event or that event, and I know that you are the God who provides for me. And when you do that, God is taking his proper place in your life. This is what Jesus means when he asks us in the Sermon on the Mount, why do you worry about what you will eat or drink or what you will wear? He's saying, why do you make a God out of those things? And he continues, if God knows how to feed the birds of the air and clothe the grass of the field, will he not much more clothe you? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? And what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the pagans? Run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. You see, when we run after these things, um, and we worry about these things, you show that you are worshiping them. Further, we need to name our burden in order to cast it upon the Lord, and this can be painful because it causes us to recognize idols in our lives, but it also forces us to admit that we are weak. And here's the challenge. When we cast our burdens onto the Lord, we're admitting that we can't handle the situation. We aren't strong enough to face the trouble. We aren't big enough to overcome the obstacle. And when you cast your burden on the Lord, you are admitting that you need God and can't do it on your own. You know, if one criticism of the Christian faith is that it is escapism, another popular criticism of the Christian faith is that it is a crutch. In Mere Apologetics, Alistair McGrath points out that one of the most pop, sorry, one of the most familiar criticisms of Christianity, it may be one of the most popular too, but one of the most familiar criticisms of Christianity is that it offers consolation to life's losers. So Christians are pictured as people who are weak and who need this faith in order to get them through life. And in a sense, a crutch is a tool for those who have a broken leg. It's an instrument of support for those who have been weakened by an injury. That's true. And let me ask you, do we mock those who use crutches? Of course not. I would mock someone who needed crutches but who refused to use them. Why would a person with a broken leg be so silly to not use a set of crutches to help them get around? And please, let's all admit that we are broken people. The question is not so much, do you use a crutch to help you get through life, but what crutch do you use? People use all kinds of things to help them get through life. Some use fast cars, others food, others use drugs, alcohol, sex, cigarettes. All these activities are designed to help people make it through a day and handle stress. Again, in the words of Alistair McGrath, if you have a broken leg, you need a crutch. If you're ill, you need medicine. That's just the way things are. The Christian understanding of human nature, says Alistair McGrath, is that we are damaged, wounded, and disabled by sin. That's just the way things are. So the question is, not do you use a crutch, but what crutch do you use? And of all that the world offers, I would much rather lean on God, depend on God, cast all my cares on a loving Heavenly Father than all the helps in this world. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. There's a word of challenge. 
we must recognize our cares and realize that we're in need of God who is bigger than our cares, stronger than the challenges that we face. But there's also a word of care here. There's also a word of care. Cast all your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. We are in a day of anxiety. We live in an a culture right now of deep pain. My generation is facing a crisis, difficulties and restrictions that we have never had to face before. And for some, it's overwhelming. Look at our text again, verse two and three. The psalmist says, my thoughts trouble me and I am distraught because of what the enemy is saying because of the threats of the wicked. The psalmist is being bullied. If he were alive today, you'd be a victim of cyberbullying. It's terrible. And he goes on to say at the end of verse 3, They bring down suffering on me and assail me in their anger. It's overwhelming for the psalmist. He says in verse 4, My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen on me. Do you identify with that? This is deep pain. So. Understand that when he says in verse 22, cast your cares upon the Lord, for he will sustain you. The word of God there isn't simply being like a caring old auntie patting you on the head and say, oh, there, there, cast all your cares on the Lord. Tomorrow will be another day. There's a silver lining behind the cloud, you know. No, no, no. This word comes to us from one who is racked with pain and in deep despair. His pain is heightened by the fact, he says in verses 12 through 14, that it is his friend who has betrayed him. He says in verse 12, if an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. And then we have those shocking words at verse 13, but it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship in the, at the house of God as we walked about among the worshipers. This is a fellow believer who has betrayed him. His pain is very deep. You identify? I don't want to belittle the pain and the worry that may be sweeping over you right now. It's real. It's real. And I don't want you to hear this as a flippant word. Well, you should just cast your burden upon the Lord. No. You are here today for a reason. God has brought you here today to hear this word. He has arranged all of history, all of your life, so that you could be here today listening to this. Cast your cares on the Lord, for he will sustain you. And the reason you can do that is he loves you. He loves you. He couldn't care more about you. He knows your pain. He knows what's threatening to bring you down into darkness itself. And he's saying, you don't have to carry it. You don't have to face it alone. Cast your cares on him, says the Lord. Cast your cares on the Lord, for he will sustain you. He's the living God. Look, look at the text. Psalmist says in verses 16 through 19, he is the living God who is alive and he hears your prayers. Verse 17, evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress and he hears my voice. Listen, you are heard by your loving Heavenly Father. Not only that, verse 18, he rescues me unharmed from the battle waged against me, even though many oppose me. Your loving Heavenly Father rescues you because he is enthroned over all things. He's, it's, that's what the text says at verse 19. He is able to meet whatever situation, whatever calamity, whatever stress you are facing, if you will but trust him because he cares for you. And we need to be reminded, don't we, of the great truths of Scripture? God's promise to Joshua, for instance, it's a promise given to you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. The promise given to Isaiah is a promise given to you. 
Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The promise given to the Roman Christians is a promise given to you. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The promise given to the psalmist is a promise given to you. Cast all your care upon the Lord, for he will sustain you. One last thing. There's a word of surrender here. When we cast our cares on the Lord, we're surrendering them to him. We're giving them to him. That, that's, that's what the psalmist is doing. He speaks of being betrayed, and clearly he carries the burden of anger and a desire for revenge. I mean, verse 15, he says in anger, let death take my enemies by surprise. Let them go down alive to the, to the realm of the dead. He's angry. And look what he does. He doesn't act on that anger. He takes that burden to God. That's what he's doing. That's what he's doing in the whole psalm. He's surrendering that burden to God in prayer. He's not acting out in revenge. He's not internalizing his anger. No, he names it and he leaves it with God. He surrenders his burden to God. He doesn't try to go fix it himself. He gives his burden to God and he leaves it with him. Have you done that? Have you cast your burden upon God and left it with him? <laughs> Or are you still carrying it? Are you, are you still nursing it? Are you allowing it to weigh heavy on your heart? Give it to God. Say to him, here's the thing that's casting me down, Lord. I give it to you. And once you've given it to him, <laughs> don't go get it again. You've given it to God. Leave it with him. Trust him. Don't dictate how he must act or when he must respond or how he must respond. Simply give your care to the Lord and leave it with him. And then no rest. No rest. <sighs> You've given it to God. And you may say, well, that's good and, and that's, that's okay, but how do I know that God can be trusted? How, how can I know that if I give my burden to God, he will truly sustain me? And the answer is pointed to for us at the cross. There at the cross, we are reminded that God came in the person of Jesus Christ, and the psalmist experience became our Lord's experience. He was reviled. The terror of death was upon him as he died on that cross for you and for me. And, and that death, he carried that largest burden of all burdens for you and for me. He took on the burden of your sin and my sin. That huge burden he carried on him. He became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. He took on that burden. And if he was able to take that burden on, which caused so much pain, so much grief, even death itself, if he was able to carry the weight of the sin of the world on his shoulders, then it follows. He's able to carry the burden that you face today. If you'll name it and leave it with him. So today, would you take that blank piece of paper and, and your pen, and if you would just take a moment and write that burden on that slip of paper. Okay, You, you don't need to share it with anyone. This is an exercise between yourself and God. Get that blank piece of paper and a pen and name that burden that is heavy on your shoulders right now, that's causing you sleepless nights, and just write it on the piece of it. It may be a sin for which you need forgiveness, a bitterness that you need healing, maybe the name of one of your children, a relative or a friend who doesn't know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Maybe a worry that you can't carry any longer. And just name it and write it down. Take time to write it. Just, just take time right now and write down that burden. 
and give it over to God. Here we are. Just name that burden. Now, you may need a little more time. I'll just pause the video if you need to. But write down the burden. Now, once you have it written out, I want you to give it to God. Say, God, here it is. Here it is. Now, I want you to take it and I want you to rip it up. I want you to rip that burden up. Yeah, I want you to either shred it, burn it, tear it up, but I want you to destroy it. Because you have given this burden to God. Now, one last thing I want you to do. Make a mental note of the day, April 11th, or if it's another day that you're watching this, April 11th, Sunday, April 11th, because Satan will come along and he will remind you of this burden and he will try to get you enwrapped with it again. And if you remember this day, you'll be able to say, no, I gave that burden to God on April 11th. It's in God's hands now. And Satan will persist and say, well, surely there's something that you must do in order to fix the problem. And you may say, well, that may be. I may have to offer a word of forgiveness or an act of reconciliation. I will do that as God calls me to do it. But the situation is in God's hands now. And because he cares for me, I know that he will look after it. Ah, but Satan will come back one more time and will say, how can you be sure? How can you be sure that God will look after it? And this time you look him in the eye and you say, my Lord carried the largest burden for me onto that cross, the burden of my sin. So I trust him now with this burden. So my friends, cast all your cares upon the Lord. For he will sustain you. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for your care in our lives. Thank you that you cared so much for us that you allowed your son to die on the cross for our sin. Thank you for your sacrifice, Lord Jesus. Thank you that now we can trust you to carry any burden that we shoulder. And we pray, Lord, that we would now know your promised rest. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I look forward to being with you next week. May God bless you. Well, this is the time when we come to uh, the Lord's table. And it's a time for us to uh, reflect and to examine ourselves in our walk with Jesus Christ and uh, how we are with God. Um, so let's, uh, let's prepare ourselves for a communion. Okay, let's uh, bow our head and examine ourselves to, to see if there's anything that we need to confess before God so that we are, are ready to, to come to the Lord's table and, and partake of this, this covenant meal. Yes. Uh, let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, as we come before uh, your table today, we want, to, we want to acknowledge you and give you thanks and all that you do and, and uh, continue to do in our lives, Lord. We, we love you and how you strengthen us and how you guide us. But more than anything, Lord, uh, we are encouraged to know that no matter what, where we are in our sinful lives, Lord, that you will continue to reinforce us and to, uh, to pick us up. But Lord, we do need to, uh, to look at the ultimate sacrifice, and that was your son, Jesus Christ, uh, and how he corrected us. And Lord, we also need to, uh, to realize that, that uh, we, are, we are anew in you, Lord. Uh, and that through this, we, we continue to, to look at this particular sacrament of blood, the wine that represents the blood of Jesus Christ and the bread that represents his broken body. So Lord, we, uh, we thank you for this and as we uh, come to your, humbly come to your table, we, uh, we give it all to you. And this we pray in your name. Let us turn to the, uh, to the word of God for the community service this morning. And as we read it, we will partake of the elements. Okay. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, 
And we did give him thanks. He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And now partake of the bread, which represents the Lord's body. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake of the Lord's cup. Okay. Therefore, we who the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned. Let's, let's pray. The precious God and Heavenly Father, as we come before your Lord's table today, Lord, we are reminded of what you did on the cross to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, many, many years ago. And he's still uh, doing the same today, Father, reaching out to those that are lost and bringing them into your kingdom, Father. And Lord, your kingdom is growing each and every day. The new family members are added, Father, because of the uh, broken, your body, body which is broken, of course, upon the cross, and your shed blood. Father Moses, uh, uh, you gave Moses and the children of Israel manna from heaven, Father, which, uh, which uh, fed the body. But Lord, your, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, came from heaven, the manna set from heaven, Father, which nourishes the spirit and the soul, Father. We thank you so much, Father, for such a great sacrifice, Father, and with your love, Father, that allowed you to send your Son into the world, to walk amongst men, and to suffer and die upon the cross. That through him, Father, you, his Father, could now be our Father. We thank you so much, Father, for this awesome privilege. In the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray these things. Amen. Amen. God bless.